Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body whether good or bad you notice the emphasis friends for we must all appear and each one all and each one all appear before the judgment seat each one may receive what is due him according to what he has done not what he has believed you may believe in jesus but your life would contradict your belief what he has done whether good or bad this is the judgment seat literally theologically it is called the bema judgment there is still a bema in corinth this was the place where the judges of the city would meet the citizens and would judge them for certain things there was no question of life or death but at the judgment seat of christ only believers will appear it is not a judgment for believers sins which christ fully atoned for on the cross the judgment is to see whether you are going to receive a reward or not when paul says we must all appear remember he is writing to believers all we believers will be judged at the bema judgment that we may receive the things done in the body not believed in the mind but done in the body i repeat the question he will ask one day is how we used these bodies how did we live on this earth paul faces this question my friend when he writes in philippians he says philippians 1 21 for me to live is christ to die is gain then paul goes on to talk of his desire to go and be with christ in heaven but also his desire to live longer so that he can serve the believers at philippi he wants to stay so that he can share the gospel of christ a little longer friends many have had the same reaction when they go through trying experiences in life better to be with christ but it is important to continue god's work here on earth for the glory of god notice verse 11 since then we know what it is to fear the lord we try to persuade men what we are is plain to god and i hope it is also plain to your conscience the goal of paul was to fear the lord and to persuade men is this your goal my friend internally fear the lord externally persuade men to also fear the lord the fear of the lord the bible says is the beginning of wisdom do you fear the lord my friend if you fear the lord that is the hub of all life verse 12 we are not trying to commend ourselves to you again but are giving you an opportunity an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart we are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us paul says in other words if you are declaring the full counsel of god you can do it in a loving manner you don't have to bring down thunder and lightning my friend however we need to recognize and we need to state very clearly that men are lost if we do so we are not commending ourselves that is we are not trying to become popular but we are earnestly eagerly persuading men to turn to jesus the prince of peace friends these days peace is so much the casualty it is our desire it must be our goal to turn this world of peacelessness to the prince of peace verse 13 if we are out of our mind it is for the sake of god if we are in our right mind it is for you verse 13 paul says that the people may think he is mad it's all right he is doing this for god for some people may think he is sober it is for their sakes that he's sober verse 14 beautiful verse my friends for christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all therefore all died and he died for all 
that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Compels us is a phrase that has often been misunderstood. The thought has been that the love of Christ restricts us, traps us down. No, it is just the opposite. That is not the meaning of the word that Paul is using here. He says that the love of Christ is pushing him on, pushing him forward, pushing him outward to share the good news of the gospel. It is the love of Christ that is the motivating factor. It is the love of Christ that causes us to give out the word of God, my friend. The love of Christ constrains us, compels us. Then he says, because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. It was this that sent Paul out to the ends of the earth with the message of the gospel. Mankind is under the sentence of death. Therefore all died, Paul says. One died for all and therefore all died. When Adam was in the Garden of Eden, my friend, he was a federal head. Note this word, federal, corporate head. He is the head, Adam is the head of the old creation. The old creation was on trial in Adam. Notice Galatians chapter 2 verses 16 and 17. Being conscious that a man does not get righteousness by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. We had faith in Christ Jesus so that we might get righteousness by faith in Christ. Righteousness by faith in Christ. True righteousness, my friends, is found only in one place, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not by the works of the law, because the works of the law will no flesh get righteousness. By the works of the law, none of us can be righteous. But if, while we were desiring to get righteousness through Christ, we ourselves were seen to be sinners, is Christ a servant of sin? In no way. Paul here is debating. Adam deliberately disobeyed God. Adam came under the sentence of death, and when he did that, he took the entire human race down with him. For all were represented in Adam. You and I, my friend, have been born into a family of death. All mankind is under the sentence of death. Someone said, the very moment that he gives life to us, he begins to take it away. David, the servant, the psalmist wrote, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Psalm 23 verse 4. He was not referring to the end of life. He was saying that all of life is like walking down through a great canyon of death, which gets darker and narrower until finally we must all go through the doorway of death. The Lord Jesus came to this world all the way from heaven. He was the one who was absolutely sinless, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He came down here to save sinners. He came from heaven. He didn't go to the mountaintop. There were no people there. He couldn't find any man on the plain of holiness. They were down in the valley here. They were all dead in their trespasses and sins. So what did he do? He came to the valley. He came down to the place of death where all men are and that he died for all. Because men were dead, he went down into death. And now, he brings believers up with him in resurrection life. My friend, does he take them back to the mountaintop where Adam had been? No, never. He takes them not just to the mountaintop, he takes them to heaven. We, my friend, who believe in the Lord Jesus, are now seated in the heavenlies. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice now verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. 
Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Now, my friend, we do not know men after the flesh, Paul says, or in other words, from a worldly point of view. Now we see men through different eyes, from those we used when we belonged to the world. Out in the world there are only lost men. James writes about this in the second chapter of his epistle. Notice, he says, It is wrong to give the honored place to a rich man who comes into your midst with a ring on his finger with fine clothing on his back while you give the poor man a place to stand right at the back. Why is this wrong? Because as the children of God, we are to look upon the whole human family as fallen from Christ and Christ took our place on the cross for us. Even the line between Jew and Gentile has been erased. All my friend in the human family are sinners before God. The only solution for all this is the gospel of the Lord Jesus. We do not, Paul says, recognize any man after the flesh. All are on the same level, on the same plane. Now let's consider the next phrase in this verse. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. I believe, my friend, that Paul did know Christ in his flesh. I think he was present even maybe at the crucifixion of Christ. I can't imagine that brilliant young Pharisee not being present at the crucifixion, this fulcrum point in Jerusalem, right now at this very moment. This crucified Savior is risen and resurrected Savior at God's right hand, the glorified Christ. Paul says, we knew him after the flesh. Now we don't know him that way anymore. We are not identified with the one who walked this earth over 19 or 21,000 years ago. We are identified with him in glory. That is why Paul says that we have died with him, but now we have been risen with him and seated with Christ in heavenly places. Therefore, Paul says, I believe the grandest verse in the whole of the New Testament next to John 3.16. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. If anyone is in Christ, it is creation once again. New creation. The old creation is gone, the new has come. If you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, what are the old things that have passed away? Remember, that we have talked about all mankind living at the bottom of the hill where all the sinners are now that we have trusted in the lord jesus christ those old relationships have passed away the old is gone we are no longer identified with adam no longer identified with the world system we are now identified with the lord jesus christ we have been baptized into the body of believers we belong to him Old things have passed away. The new thing is the new relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in a relationship with the glorified Christ. How can we be absolutely sure that we are new creation in Christ? Listen to what the Lord Jesus says in John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say to you, the man whose ears are open to my word, who has faith, in him who sent me has eternal life. He will not be judged, but has come from death into life. My friend, have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you trust him? If you do, he assures that you have eternal life, that you will not come into judgment, that you have passed from death into life. This makes you a brand new creation, no longer subject to judgment and to death and to the law you have passed into life. Do not try, my friend, to base your confidence on experience. You are a new creation because Jesus says so. The basis is the word of God. 
you no longer belong to the old creation that fell in Adam. The new creation stands in Christ Jesus and you are in him if you are putting your trust in him. You and I stand in the place of danger and temptation. We may fail many, many ways, many, many times, but the wonderful truth, my friend, is that the Lord Jesus Christ has redeemed us. We are a new creation in Him. You and I also are twice bought. God generated us. Sin degenerated us. Now in Christ, God regenerates us. A believer may not have prosperity, but he does have soul prosperity. We are rich in Christ. May God bless you, friends. Music